wow, that, that happened very quickly. <laughs> Um, hello, everyone. My name is Hasina Moyden, and I'm honored to welcome you to our first Dean's Diversity Lecture of the Year with Dr. Arun Gandhi. Some of you joined us for our peace vigil this morning, where we reflected on the need for peace in our world today. What we hope you took away from that experience, as well as what we hope you will take away from the talk today, are ways in which we can each make a difference and be the change. And to get us started, I would like to welcome Dean Camilla Benbo, the Patricia and Rhodes Hart Dean of Education and Human Development, who has been a model of the ways we can make a difference and be the change here at Peabody College. And in fact, this Dean's Diversity Lecture series is an excellent example of her commitment to creating a more equitable, inclusive culture here at Peabody. So please join me in welcoming Dean Benbo. Good afternoon, and welcome to another Dean's Diversity Lecture. I am excited that today's event gives us a chance to welcome so many visitors to Peabody College. What a, what a full room, and I know it's also live stream, so there are lots of people that we cannot see that are listening in. So welcome to all of you who are online. And of course, we are honored to be able to host Dr. Gandhi. But first, it is my role today to introduce Vanderbilt's Interim Chancellor and Provost, Susan Wente. When we learned that Susan Wente was going to become our Interim Chancellor, a post that she took on in August, I was absolutely delighted. It has been my great pleasure to serve under her as Dean since she became Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs in 2014. She has been a great champion for Peabody, my baby. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to becoming provost, Susan was already an internationally respected scientist known for her work on the biological mechanisms of cellular transport. Under her academic leadership, Vanderbilt as a whole has thrived as a center for innovation, collaboration, and discovery. As interim chancellor, Susan Wente now oversees all facets of the university, and I'm personally excited to see where she's going to take us, because I know it will be an exciting ride. So, as many of you know, we started these di Dean's Diversity Lectures several years ago to create opportunities for wider discussions in our community about topics of equity, diversity, and inclusion. While these topics are often addressed in our curriculum, we felt the need to affirm these values more strongly in our own community life. Chancellor Wente, I'm glad to note, shares these values, and she has been a powerful advocate for putting them front and center at Vanderbilt's work. Not only that, but she herself is a model for creating opportunity. As Vanderbilt's first female provost and the first woman to lead the university in an interim capacity or otherwise, she is an advocate for women in science and the importance of equity and inclusion across all academic affairs. Toward that end, she launched Vanderbilt's first Office of Inclusive Excellence. I'm delighted to have her here with us today to introduce our featured speaker. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to all of you here today. And although my voice is a little rough and ragged, I would not miss this for anything. It's such a special, special occasion to be able to come and welcome our very special speaker and also to really have an opportunity to see the Peabody campus and community and our whole community coming together. Thank you, Dean Bimbo, for that very generous introduction and for your leadership in organizing this series. It's events like this that I think really show how the Vanderbilt community can come together and really unite ourselves in terms of thinking about how these pressing issues in our society can be addressed. <clears throat> I also want to thank you, Dean Bebo, for your incredible service over these past 21 years and for your graciously accepting an offer of reappointment as dean. We have much to look forward to. Thank you. Under her vision, as you had heard, Peabody is working and has been working to be a model community where individuals from diverse backgrounds, diverse perspectives and expertise are, are welcomed, are embraced, and then are positioned for further success. 
I also want to extend my gratitude to all, I think it was almost 75 people who gathered on Magnolia Lawn this morning in the heat. I really want to thank you for um, taking that challenge and doing that work this morning in terms of the, the peace vigil. Vanderbilt's community, Vanderbilt's collegiality, Vanderbilt's compassion for all was truly reflected in the fact that you made the time to do that and to come together. <clears throat> So given the, the many divisions that we know exist and the injustices that exist in society overall, our being able to come together as one Vanderbilt in this way can have such a powerful effect as we focus on what we all strive for, peace, exactly what the vigil was about regarding this morning. I think that if we work together, <clears throat> we can achieve our mission of continually striving to do better to do better here on our campus, to do better in our community, and to do better in our world in terms of pressing forward for, for positive change. And if we do so, I also feel that we will continue to be inspired like today's speaker, who have dedicated their lives to empowering those around them. And it's with that that it is indeed an honor for us at Vanderbilt all of everyone at Peabody to host Dr. Arun Gandhi here at Vanderbilt. Dr. Gandhi is an activist, he's a journalist, he's an author, he's a philanthropist, and as you will soon hear, a motivational speaker. His work explores the interplay of violence and peace, how those themes are communicated throughout our society. <clears throat> As the founder of the M.H. Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence at the University of Rochester and the Gandhi Worldwide Education Institute, Dr. Gandhi has spoken to audiences around the world about the importance of nonviolence, the importance of social harmony, and the teachings of his grandfather, the Venerable Mahatma Gandhi. We have all heard the famous quote from his grandfather, and I thank you. Professor Shields, <clears throat> and the, the, the quote on the bracelet from a weekend celebration that he had, be the change you wish to see in the world. Although we've all heard it, how do we each embrace it, and how do we think about it going forward? Dr. Gandhi has certainly dedicated himself to this theme, promoting peace and nonviolence on a global scale. And even more so, helping us here to think about today and reflect today on how action is put into, some, put into this to help fully support what we do, be it research, be it discovery, be it teaching, be it learning. Our innovative initiatives surrounding diversity and inclusion need to think about how we each embrace that theme. We are so proud to have you with us here today, Dr. Gandhi, to share your thoughts. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here uh, at the Vanderbilt University. I'm really overwhelmed by all the love and affection that I've uh, received in the last two days that I've been here in Nashville. Um, and it's very heartwarming. Uh, and uh, especially being part of this diversity program, because diversity was very close to my grandfather's heart. Actually, I'm sure those of you who have read his biography would know that uh, it was the lack of respect for diversity in South Africa that gave rise to my grandfather. Um, you know, it was the, all the prejudices that existed there at the time when he decided to go there and represent a legal case. And within a week of his arrival in that country, he was subjected to so much hate and prejudice uh, he was picked up and thrown off the train because he was not allowed to travel by first class, uh, being a black person. And the, all that humiliation really uh, got him uh, interested in why is this happening? 
Why are people hating each other so much? And what can be done uh, to get justice? And he thought about this uh, for many days. And it was uh, then that uh, the idea of nonviolent action dawned on him. Uh, and largely because he, he, did, he abhorred violence of any kind uh, right from his birth. And so he wanted something that was more civilized to deal with, uh, with this issue. And that's how the whole concept of nonviolence was born. And it was strangely and very significantly on 9-11-1906 that he launched his first nonviolent campaign in South Africa. And I consider that day, 9-11-1906, as the day, birthday of sanity. Uh, because his whole philosophy of nonviolence is based on sanity and um, a sane response to the conflicts that we have in our uh, lives. Um, and so it was the birthday of sanity and 9-11-2001 was the day we killed sanity because we chose violent options for the conflicts that we faced. I remember I wrote an article uh, for the New York Times, or actually I offered it to anybody who was willing to publish it on uh, the day after 9-11, 2001, uh, saying that this is not the time for us to uh, seek revenge or, or fight a war. This is the time for us to reflect on why uh, are our relationships with that part of the world so bad that they decided to attack us in this form? And what can we do to uh, change those relationships so that we can build a better world and a better society? But of course, all the re newspapers rejected it, saying that this is not the time to talk of peace. And I was surprised because if we don't talk of peace in a moment of crisis, when do we talk of peace? And, um, but now we are uh, in the 18th year of a war that we can't put an end to, and we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, today, um, in, on the news, we heard that uh, the president has got the armed forces ready for attacking Iran. And uh, it, it's just going to get uh, worse and, and messier. And a lot of this is, you know, not related to justice. It, is, it has its roots in other reasons and causes. But it's up to the human beings, up to all of us, uh, whether we want to accept this kind of uh, uh, future for our uh, children, or whether we want to make a difference. Uh, and, and that is where grandfather's philosophy of nonviolence comes uh, into being, because it empowers every individual to uh, do something to improve this world. I was very fortunate in uh, having had the two years to live with grandfather between the age of 12 and 14. And um, the lessons that he taught me during those two years uh, really made a very big difference in my understanding of him and his philosophy. And, um, and as I grew up, I began to understand how uh, this has completely changed my life. And so I decided that if something has changed my life for the good, <clears throat> If I share it with other people, it will help them change their life for good also. And so I dedicated myself to going out and speaking about uh, these lessons and, and uh, the importance of these lessons. Um, I know the first, very first lesson he taught me was about anger, because I was a very angry young boy. I grew up in South Africa where I was born. 
At a time when there was a lot of hate there, everybody seemed to hate everybody for one reason or the other. And I became a victim at the age of 10, uh, beaten up by whites and then beaten up by blacks, both the times because they didn't like the color of my skin. And I wanted eye for an eye revenge. And it became such an obsession with me, <clears throat> excuse me, that I started going to the gymnasium and pumping iron and doing exercises because I wanted to be big and strong and be able to fight back again. And that's when my parents realized and uh, they decided it was time to go to India and give me the opportunity to live with grandfather. And Grandpa, the first lesson that he taught me was about understanding anger and being able to use that energy constructively. He said anger is like electricity. <clears throat> it's just as useful and just as powerful, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to use anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse it and cause death and destruction. Today we don't teach anger, we don't talk about it, we just allow everybody to find their own way of dealing with it. And the result is that all of us end up abusing anger. Harvard University recently did a study and they came to the conclusion that more than 80% of the violence that we experience either in our personal lives or in the lives of our nations is generated by anger. And if we learn to, uh, to uh, understand anger, and channel that energy constructively, we would be able to reduce violence to such a substantial extent there. So it's very important for us to learn about anger and how to deal with this constructively. One of the th things that he taught me was uh, about mind, strength of the mind. You know, today we are very conscious about our physical health, and so we do a lot of physical exercises, uh, but we never do any mental exercises. And uh, the result of that is that we don't have any control over our minds. We'll find that any, at any given moment, our mind is filled with about a half a dozen different thoughts that are going through at the same time. And to that extent, we are distracted from what is going on at the present. And so we need to learn to control our minds and the control can only be achieved if we have strong mind. So he made me sit quietly in a room for a few minutes every day and hold in front of me something that gave me pleasure to look at. It could be a photograph or it could be a flower or whatever. Hold that in front of me for one minute, concentrate my, all my energy on that object and then close my eyes and see how long I could retain that image in my mind. In the beginning, I found that the moment I closed my eyes, the image vanished because I didn't have any control. But when I began to do this exercise regularly every day, I found that I could keep that image longer and longer in my mind. And to that extent, my mind was coming under my control. So once you have control over your mind, then you don't react to a situation uh, and do something that you regret. So when you get angry, you can move away from there and find a, a better solution to the problem and then address that problem. I did this for many years. And in, in, in addition to that, he also made me write an anger journal. Uh, and he said, uh, but write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem and then commit yourself to finding a solution. Now that is very important 
Because today a lot of people say that they have been writing an anger journal for a long time, but it hasn't really helped them because every time they go back and read the journal, they are just reminded of the incident and they get angry all over again. Because we pour our anger out into the journal, it gives us momentary satisfaction. We got it out of our system. But we, as long as we don't solve the problem that caused the anger, it's just going to come back again and again. So it's very important for us to write the journal with the intention of finding a solution and then commit ourselves to finding a solution. I did this and I learned, uh, the, I think both of these uh, manners of uh, dealing with anger are very important because I was able to transform um, the uh, anger into positive action instead of uh, abusive ang action. But after learning this profound lesson from him, I was just 12 years old at the time, I decided to test him and see whether he himself had learned the lesson or not. <laughs> and this was the time in his life when he was involved in many important things. He was concerned about the emancipation of women, the education of children, the emancipation of the so-called untouchable people. So he had programs going on in all these different fields. and. Um, he needed funds for these programs. And he realized that the easiest way for him to raise the money he needed was to sell his autograph. So he put a fee of five rupees for each autograph, which in today's money would be about five dollars. And uh, every morning and evening when thousands of people would assemble for his interfaith prayer services, uh, many of them would seek his autograph. So while I was living with him, it was my duty to go out into the audience and collect the autograph books and the money and bring it to him for his signature. And one day I thought to myself, if everybody could get his autograph, why not me? After all, I'm his grandson and I deserve an autograph too. But I didn't have any money. <clears throat> So I got myself a little book and I slipped it into the pile and hoping that he wouldn't notice the absence of money there. But when he came to that book, he said, why is there no money for this autograph? And I said, because it's my book. And he said, well, you should know that I don't make an exception even for grandsons. <laughs> that if you want an autograph, you'll not only have to pay me for it, but you'll have to earn the money and pay me. Don't ask your parents for it. <laughs> and I said, no way. I said, you are my grandfather and I'm going to make you give me this autograph free. So he laughed and said, all right, let's see who wins. <laughs> and from that day, every day when he was in high level political discussions with British politicians, or Indian politicians, I would barge into the room with my autograph book, thrust it in his face and demand an autograph. <laughs> my logic was that just to get rid of me, he would sign the book and give it to me. But instead, every time I became too boisterous, all he did was put his hands across my mouth, press my head against his chest and went on talking politics. <laughs> On many occasions, the other politicians used to get exasperated and tell grandfather, why don't you give him the autograph? He disturbs our meetings every day. And grandfather would just smile and say, this is a private joke between the two of us. You don't have to get involved in it. <laughs> the long and short of it is he never did give me the autograph. <laughs> But he never, ever told me to get out of the room and leave him alone. Like we would do with our siblings or uh, our children. If, we, if they came into the room while we are doing something important, we sometimes very rudely tell them, get out, can't you see I'm busy just now? But he never, ever did that to me. 
And that's when I realized that if he could control his anger to that extent, if we attempt to achieve 50% of it, we will make such a big difference in the level of violence we experience today. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is for us to learn about anger, not shun it, not be uh, uh, ashamed of it, but anger is something good. What we need to be ashamed of is the way we abuse it. And so it's, uh, it's something very important for us to learn. But equally important for us to understand is what do we mean by peace and what do we mean by violence? If we want to work for peace, we need to understand all the different forms of violence that we commit today. Most of us are only concerned about the physical violence, not the passive violence that we commit. And this lesson I learned through a little pencil. A little three-inch butt of a pencil became the subject of another lesson. I was coming back from school and I had this little pencil in my hands and I thought I deserved a better pencil and so I just threw it away because I was so sure grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for one. But that evening when I asked grandfather for a new pencil, instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how did the pencil become small, where did I throw it away, why did I throw it away, and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. And I said, you must be joking. He said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh yes, I do, he has a flashlight. And he sent me out with a flashlight to look for this pencil, and I think I spent about two hours searching for it. And when I found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources and when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources, and that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world, and because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources, and they have to live in poverty and that is violence against humanity. And that was the first time I realized that all of these little things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, things that we overconsume and throw away and waste because we have so much of it uh, and that we can afford to do it, that every time we do any of those things, we are committing violence e either against nature or against other human beings. To make me understand this lesson thoroughly, he made me draw a genealogical tree of violence with violence as the grandparent and physical violence and passive violence as the two branches. And every day before I went to bed, I had to examine and analyze everything that I had experienced during the day. Things that I may have done to other people or people may have done to me or things that I may have read about or experienced, whatever it was, everything had to be analyzed and put in their appropriate places. If it was the kind of physical violence where we use physical force against each other, that would go on the physical violence. But if it's the kind of violence where we don't use any physical force, and yet we hurt people, directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously, our actions hurt somebody somewhere all the time. Even in things like the way we relate to people, the way we look upon people, the way we judge people, uh, the way we put down people, 
Uh, all of these things uh, are, are passive violence. The way we overconsume resources and destroy resources and throw away things, that is also passive violence. So the question that I had to ask myself was, if somebody were to do this to me, would I be helped by it or would I be hurt by it? And if I came to the conclusion that it would hurt me, then that would be passive violence. And when I began to do this introspection, I was amazed that within a few months I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. The physical violence didn't grow very much because there's a limit to what you can do physically. But the passive violence grew endlessly. And that is when he explained to me the connection between the two. He said, we commit passive violence all the time, every day, consciously and unconsciously. And that generates anger in the victim, and the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. So it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically, if we want to put out the fire of physical violence, we have to cut off the fuel supply. And since the fuel supply comes from each one of us, we have to become the change we wish to see in the world. If we don't change our habits and our relationships and our attitudes, we will never be able to bring peace in this world. We see today, we have very little understanding of different people, different philosophies, different uh, races. Uh, we, um, because they don't look like us, we hate them and, and uh, we don't want them anywhere near us. And, and all of that creates all this conflict uh, in, in people. Actually, <clears throat> the whole philosophy of nonviolence is based on the principles of uh, love, respect, understanding, acceptance, appreciation, compassion. These are all positive attitudes, all attitudes that each one of us has within ourselves. But we suppress them because we consider them to be signs of weakness that we want to show aggression, we want to show power, we want to show that we are not doormats, and so we project an image of aggressive attitude, and we suppress all the goodness within us. What nonviolence seeks is to bring out that goodness. We don't have to be ashamed of the goodness that exists within us. We need to be proud of it and show it, and, and ex and show it in our relationships to, uh, with each other. So relationships in a non culture of nonviolence are built on the principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. We have to respect ourselves and respect each other and respect all our connection with all of creation. And when we respect that, then we will understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth. We are not here by accident. We are not here just to pass the time from birth to death, doing the same old thing all over and over again. We are here for a purpose. Each one of us is here for a purpose. And our purpose may be a very small purpose just to make our neighborhoods better because of our presence there. But it is that purpose that we need to recognize and, and, uh, and, and implement. If we don't, then we just exist from birth to death and uh, do the same routines every day, get up and go to work and make money and buy things and, and back again to square one and we go on day after day doing the same thing. We never look at our purpose in life. So it's when we understand the purpose in life and fulfill that purpose in life that we will then be able to um, accept each other as human beings and not 
classify people by labels we have put upon them. Today we have so many labels on people to identify people that we have forgotten that behind those labels there is a human being. We have religious labels and economic labels and social labels and uh, educational labels and you name it and we have a label and we identify peop people by those labels. So we need to remove all those labels and just look at people as human beings and when we are able to accept them as human beings, then we will appreciate our own humanity. So this is what nonviolence teaches us. This is what nonviolence expects all of us to do, uh, to, to create a better society, to create harmony in society. Peace can only thrive in society when there is harmony. The absence of war doesn't mean we are living in peace because we are exploiting people in all kinds of different ways all the time. So it's only when we create harmony and stop exploiting people and, and start expect, accepting and respecting people that we will be able to create uh, uh, peace in this world. So it's very important for us to understand all of these concepts of nonviolence and become uh, understand it better. One of the results of our not understanding the philosophy of nonviolence is what we see in India today and what we see in the United States today. Although there was a major campaign led by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, in the United States for civil rights of the African-American people. Civil rights were granted in 1960, but we find that integration is still far, far away from us. We tolerate people, which is an evil. We don't want to tolerate people, we want to respect people. And the reason why we are so far away from integration, both here as well as in India with the low caste people, is because we sought a legal solution to a moral problem. The legal solution is that the law can allow people to be where they want to be. They can allow people to come and sit here in this auditorium uh, with everybody else there. But there is no law that can make one person respect the other person if they don't want to. And as long as we lack that respect for each other, we will never have a proper integration and we will never have peace in society. So we have to work towards peace. And that is where both education at home as well as education in schools come in. Unfortunately today, because of the materialistic lifestyle that we have chosen, where everybody needs to go out and work to make more money, to buy more things and, and, and to pay the bills and, and so on. So there is very little education at home because the parents are busy their children are growing up with strangers in daycare centers and, uh, and uh, so on. So there, there is no foundation for the children at home. And the schools uh, find it more prudent to give education, to give young people a career that they can go out and exploit and make money. So education today is based on giving a person a career but not building the character of the person. There is no component in education today that uh, builds the character of the person or, or, or teaches us about the diversity that exists in our societies. And as long as we lack these uh, kinds of things, uh, we are never going to be able to create uh, harmony in this world. So we have to take a very deep look into uh, our lives as well as in the lives of our nations and uh, learn to do the right thing. 
I want to conclude now with one final story, a story that my grandfather used to be very fond of telling us of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came there and did their best, but nobody could satisfy the king. And then there was an intellectual from another town who came on a visit and the king asked him, the meaning of peace, and he said, the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go to him and ask him the meaning of peace. And so the next day, the king went to the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage quietly went to the back of the house and came back with a grain of wheat and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course, the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace. And he didn't want to show his ignorance. And so he clutched that grain of wheat and went back to the palace and he found a little gold box and he placed that grain of wheat in the box and every morning he would open the box to look for an answer and he couldn't find any answers. So a few days later when this uh, intellectual came back on a return visit, the king asked him to explain. He said, you sent me to the sage and he gave me this grain of wheat and I don't know what this grain of wheat has to do with peace. And that's when the intellectual said it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish, and that will be the end of the story. But if you had allowed this grain of wheat to interact with all the elements, if you had planted it outside in the soil, it would sprout and grow, and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. If somebody has found peace and if they keep it locked up in their hearts for their own good, it will perish with them. But if they let it interact with all the elements, it would sprout and grow and very soon we could have a whole world of peacemakers. So I've come here today to give you the grain of wheat that I got from my grandfather and I hope that you won't let it rot and perish but let it interact so that all of us together can make a difference in this world and make it a better place for future generations. Thank you. So now we're just going to take a few moments, um, and we have some microphones. If you would like to ask Dr. Gandhi a question, we will take a few before uh, we dismiss. And while we're waiting, I would like to uh, thank our community partner, Reverend John McLean. John, would you stand up? John is the pastor at Unity of Nashville, and it is because of his partnership with Peabody College and Vanderbilt University that we were able to have Dr. Gandhi here at Peabody today. Any questions? Here's. We have one up here. Okay. Hi, I'm Anna Harutinian, and I'm one of the diverse, small diverse groups here in Nashville. Thank you very much for your speech. It's very inspiring. I would like to ask you to speak a little bit from the perspective of religion. 
how you correlate religion with peace and the phobia that is existing today related to different religions, how that plays out with peace. Thank you. Religion, did you say? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, religion, religion, instead of uniting us and bringing us together and instead of promoting love and understanding between people, it's more divisive. We're dividing people more and more uh, by religion and now even by sub-denominations within the denomination and it's just going, uh, I think it's going berserk. Uh, and, and it's uh, not doing service to the people. Uh, my grandfather rec recognized this uh, hundred years ago uh, when he realized that uh, the only way to bring people together was by uniting and showing respect to different religions. So he um, <clears throat> stopped going to temples, the Hindu temples, he evolved a prayer service of his own, which included Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, all religions, uh, prayers. And we would sit in a room like this and thousands of people would join him and they would all sing all these different prayers together. And uh, that's how he showed uh, people that we can respect because there's only one God, whatever name we call that uh, by him, it's, there's only one uh, God there. And so um, we have to understand that. And he used to also uh, tell us children that religion is like climbing a mountain. We are all ultimately going up to the same peak, so why should it matter to anybody which side of the mountain we choose to climb up from? We just respect everybody's decision. If they want to climb up from the west side or the east side or the north side, it's an individual choice and we should respect that. So it's when we have that kind of a healthy, respectful relationship, uh, even in religion, as we should in personal uh, relationships, then we will bring about more love and understanding. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Gandhi. Um, my name is Justin. I'm a divinity student across the street. And my question is about um, a story about your grandfather that was inspiring in my work, particularly in the story of the, of the Salt March. And as you know here, we're living in this Trump era where we see a lot of violence, both passive and overt violence, um, denial of health care, ecological devastation. We have KKK people and neo-Nazis marching in our streets. And so my question is, how do we embody nonviolence that does not become routine? I think we've had more marches than we can count since this president assumed office. We had the women's march, you had the student walkout, you have another walkout happening this week about the environment, and it just seems very routine. People keep walking out, but it's not disrupting these violent systems. And so my question to you is, is what are ways that we can embody a nonviolence that is not sentimental, that's not routine, but that is very disruptive to the status quo of violence? Yes, we do have a lot of problems in the world today and uh, get just going more and more deeper into the uh, situation. Uh, that is largely because we as uh, citizens have, uh, uh, you know, we've, um, we, we think that we elect people as our leaders and we give them the right to do whatever they want to uh, as our leaders and we are supposed to follow them. So, you know, there are two types of leaderships. One is uh, the leadership that a herdsman provides to a flock of sheep. Uh, the herdsman takes the flock of sheep and they quietly follow the herdsman wherever he goes. They don't know whether he's taking them to greener pastures or they're taking them to the slaughterhouse. And when they end up in the slaughterhouse, then they regret what's happened, but it's too late to regret. The other type of leadership is where the leaders uh, serve the people by empowering the people to recognize their own potential and, and the potential to uh, be part of this whole society and to create a, a, a stronger society. And that is the leadership we are lacking today. Uh, we have the herdsman leadership, 
and uh, everybody from the president down to the congressman and then everybody tells you you keep quiet and follow us and we are we know where we are taking you and so you know it's our responsibility also as citizens to take some time to make this democracy uh, uh, you know more meaningful and 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 uh, useful for everybody and so we should be uh, willing to participate in in protests it should not be tokenism it should be meaningful protests and by meaningful protests i mean that very often we think well this issue doesn't bother me i'm quite happy with my life so why should i bother about it and we don't take any action there uh, you know like uh, for instance the uh, integration issue we think it's the african american issue why should we be bothered about it we are not african american but we are all part of this human society and so we have to be conscious of what part of the society is suffering and we uh, must uh, make our voices uh, equally uh, heard in in those kinds of things so uh, we have to be more active more meaningful and and not just do things for token thing I think we have time for one or two more questions. So first of all, thank you for the work you're doing and for joining us today. Uh, I'm on the faculty, a colleague of Dr. Shields. Lots of um, opportunity for hopelessness right now as the conversation we just had exemplified, but what is making you most hopeful right now? What are you seeing that makes you hopeful? Well, I see all of you here today, and that is very hopeful because uh, uh, that means that you have an open mind. You have come here to learn something from me, and I hope that I have been able to teach you that. Um, one of the things I learned from my grandfather was not to have high expectations. <laughs> when you have too many high expectations, then you uh, get disappointed because you can't achieve all that. So if I had come here uh, with the expectation of um, having the whole of Vanderbilt student community here uh, listening to me, I would be very disappointed because that's not going to happen. 13,000 students are not going to come to listen to me. But a few hundred people or uh, you know, come, I'm happy. So don't have very high expectations, then you don't fall hard. Is there one last question? Okay. Do we have a microphone? So if you don't have high expectations, how do you keep on keeping on? Well, if you're just satisfied with what little you can achieve, what few seeds you can plant, that's why I called myself a peace farmer. My designation on my card is peace farmer. Like a farmer goes out into the fields and plants seeds and he hopes and prays that he gets a good crop, I go out and plant seeds of peace and I hope and pray that I get a good crop of peacemakers. So we do want to thank Dr. Gandhi for being here today, and I want to let you know that uh, in, in conclusion, that uh, Mayor David Browley uh, had a proclamation, and I'd like to read it to you. Uh, he declared Saturday, September 14, 2019, be the change day. In the city of Nashville and Davidson County, I invite the entire Nashville community to join me in recognizing Mahatma Gandhi's 150th birthday in an appreciation of his work in promoting nonviolence the world over. Further, we extend sincere and grateful appreciation 
to Mr. Arun Gandhi for his significant accomplishments and contributions toward the welfare of our country. We welcome him to our city and extend best wishes for his continued success, happiness, and good health in the years to come. I here unto set my hand on this 13th day of September, 2019, da David Browley, Mayor. And then we also received from the governor by Bill Lee, governor, on behalf of the people of Tennessee, by virtue of the authority vested in me, I hereby confer upon Arun Gandhi, commemorating his visit to Unity of Nashville and to Vanderbilt on the eve of his grandfather Mahatma Gandhi's 150th birthday, and in appreciation of his work promoting nonviolence around the world, a day of recognition given under my hand and the great seal of the state of Tennessee and Nashville, this 15th day of September, 2019, Bill Lee. I know that Hasina is going to conclude our time here, but I want to personally thank um, the Chancellor, our Dean, all of you for just having this time for us to sit and be peaceful, for us to contemplate that, to think about it, to put it in our hand, and to take that grain of wheat now and spread it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Gandhi, for being here and for sharing those stories with us. And, and thank, I, I want to say that this program would not be possible without the help of so many people, um, including our entire um, Office of Student Engagement, of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, several people in the Dean's Office, Brian Smokler, our wonderful tech guru, um, and so many offices who came together to participate both in the Peace Vigil and in this um, keynote lecture today. We do have a book, book signing with Dr. Gandhi in the Wyatt lobby um, immediately following this session. But I'd also like to share with you, you see kind of these quotes on either side. One of the things that we did with our incoming um, first year students here at Peabody College was ask them, what are ways that you can make a difference and be the change, which really combines quotes from George Peabody as well as Mahatma Gandhi, because at Peabody College, we also want to make a difference, make a difference in the lives of the communities and the schools that we go into. And these quotes are ways in which our first year students feel like they can also make a difference in their communities, in their schools, and in the world today. And so in, in addition, we also had the University School of Nashville share ways in which our youth are thinking about the ways that they can make a difference and be the change. You'll see one downstairs, too, at the book signing if you choose to join us. But join us once more to thank Dr. Gandhi for being here with us and for sharing his stories. Thank you.